Hey, Sin and Space fans. Uh, I finally finished my cancer treatment, which is awesome. Um, that sounded disingenuous. Anyway, we have four chapters left in this book. And if you hear what sounds like paper ripping in the background, that would be my pet rats ripping up a cardboard box. And if you hear scraping or scratching or meowing, that would be Luna demanding my attention. But I've done my best to mitigate the sounds. I don't actually have a studio. And, um, I hope you enjoy. Chapter 24. Keep him away from me, Cram screamed. Mimi raced through Tony's living room into the hospital half of the hut. It was Hank standing rigidly still, glaring at the writer. You don't understand about Mars, Hank was saying in a hard monotone. You never saw the rim rocks when there was just enough light to tell them from the sky or walked a hundred miles in the desert, watching the colors change every minute. Mrs. Johnson, get him out of here. He's crazy. Mimi took Hank by the arm. I'm not crazy, he said. Those boomers at Pitco, this writer here, Bell and his soldiers, Brenner and his factory, they're crazy. They're trying to cheapen Mars. Hysteria, thought Mimi. She'd coped with enough cases of it when she'd bossed girls at desks as far as the eye could see on the 76th floor of the American Insurance Group's building. Radcliffe, she said. There was a savage whip crack in her voice. He turned to her, startled. I wasn't going to hurt him, he said confusedly. Get him to cry. Break him. Until then, there's no knowing what will happen. Your poor wife's lying in there, she said with measured nastiness, and you find time to brawl with a sick man. I didn't mean anything like that, he protested. Still unbroken. Get into the bedroom, she said. Sit there, that's the least you can do. He walked heavily into the room where his wife's body lay, and she heard him drop into a plastic chair. Thanks, Mrs. Johnson, said Graham painfully. He was spoiling for a fight. Mrs. Jonathan, she corrected, and I don't want your thanks. She turned and rattled through drawers of medications, hoping she'd find something she could give to Hank. She didn't know what to use or how much. She slapped the drawer shut and was angry with Tony and Anna for not being there when she needed them. She stalked into the bedroom and stared at Hank without showing any pity. He was looking dully at the wall, a spot over the bed on which Joan's broken body lay. No shakes, no tears, unbroken still. But she couldn't bring herself to lash him further and precipitate the emotional crisis. She went back into Tony's living room and threw herself into a chair. She'd hear if anything happened. Mrs. J, the terror of auditing, old eagle eye, and a few less complimentary things when the girls were talking between the booths in one of the 76th floor johns. Efficiency bonuses year after year, even bad years, and that meant you were an old witch. She must be out of practice, or getting soft, she decided harshly, if she couldn't handle an absurdly simple little thing like this. We ought to have Tony train somebody besides Anna, she thought. There's Harve, but he only knows radio health. And she remembered that it didn't matter. Sun Lake wouldn't last that long. She heard a plane coming in at the landing field and wondered whose. Hank stirred in the bedroom and she tensed, but then she heard the creak of his big body slumping back into the chair. He wouldn't break. He had too much of the old Mars men in him, a tough old breed. In the old days, if she'd been assigning a pair of girls to an audit program, she would have made a match like Hank and Joan. One starry-eyed and on fire for an ideal, the other solidly and physically in love with faraway places for their farness and mystery. But it had worked here, and they'd had their measure of happiness before they had to taste their measure of hell. Hank should have come earlier. He should have been one of the first, eating out of cans, mapping and mining, bearded to his waist, inarticulate, but sure about what he wanted. Joan should have come later. She should have been an immigrant after the colony had licked Mars medicine, while there was still grinding work and sacrifice enough to please the most impassioned, but not so much that a frail body would crumple under it. But there wasn't going to be any later, of course. It was hard to get used to that realization. She got up and had a drink of water from the wall canteen, and then, defiantly, another, because it didn't matter now. She felt like taking on the world for Sun Lake. Joan must have felt like that. Their water supply was scanty, but it was water not the polluted fluid of earth, chlorinated to the last potable degree. The intercom in the bedroom buzzed. She walked in and picked it up, glanced at Hank, still numbly staring. Hello, Mimi. It was Harve. Answer from Bell. Quote, Ari is sold on Douglas Graham. I and detail of guards will take action this matter. Request use pack facilities denied. Hamilton Bell, etc., etc. What do you figure he'll do? Try and pin the Graham slugging on us, too? I don't know she said. Doesn't matter. What plane was that? Brenner's, 
Snooty bastard didn't even check in with us. Just sat right down on the field. He might as well he'll own it soon enough. She heard Harv clear his throat embarrassedly. Well, I guess that's all. Goodbye, she agreed, hanging up. She shouldn't have said that. She was supposed to pretend that while there was life, there was hope. Hank? She asked gently and inquiringly. He looked up. I'm all right, thanks. He wasn't, but there was nothing she could do. She looked through the door to the hospital. Graham seemed to be dozing. She sat down in the living room again. Brenner came in without knocking. They told me you were here, Mrs. Jonathan. I wonder if we could go to your office in the lab. I want to talk business. I'm staying here, she said shortly. If you want to talk here, I'll listen. Brenner shrugged and sat down. Do we have privacy? There's a boy in the next room going crazy with grief over his dead wife and over the prospect of leaving Mars, and there's a badly beaten man sleeping in the hospital quarters. The drug manufacturer lowered his voice. Relative privacy, he said. Mrs. Jonathan, you have the only business head in the colony. He opened his briefcase on the table and edged the corner of a sheaf of bills from one of its pockets. The top one was a thousand dollars. He didn't look at it but rifled the sheaf with his thumb, slowly, like a gambler manipulating a deck of cards. They were all thousands, and there were over one hundred of them. "'It's going to be very hard on some of the colonists, I'm afraid,' he said conversationally. "'You have no idea.' "'It needn't be that hard on all of them.' His thumb flipped through the big bills. "'Your colony is facing an impossible situation, Mrs. Jonathan. Let's not mince words. It's a matter of bankruptcy and forced sale.' I'm in a position to offer you a chance to retreat in good order with some money in your pockets. That's very kind of you, Mr. Brenner. I'm not sure I understand. Please, he smiled. Let's not be coy. I'm being perfectly candid with you. If it comes to a forced sale, I intend to bid as high as necessary. I need this property. But I'm not a man who believes in leaving things to chance. Why shouldn't you sell to me now? It would save yourselves the humiliation of bankruptcy, and I believe everyone concerned would benefit financially. You realize I'm not in a position to close any deals, Mr. Brenner? She asked. Yes, of course. You have a council in charge here, don't you? And you're a member. You could plead my case with them. I suppose I could. All right. He smiled again, and his thumb continued to rifle the pile of bills. Then I have to plead it first with you. Why should you stay on Mars, in the hope that your something will turn up? Believe me, it will not. Your commercial standing will be gone. Nobody would dream of extending credit to the people who were six months behind on their deliveries. Nothing will turn up, Mrs. Jonathan. What if the stolen Marcane turns up? Then, of course, he smiled and shrugged. Mimi read a momentary alarm in his face. For the first time since the crisis, she entertained the thought that it was not a frame-up. She pressed harder. What if we're just waiting to hand Bell the hundred kilos and the thief? Brenner turned inscrutable again. Then something else will happen. And if the colony survives that, something else again. He quickly denied the implication of sabotage by adding, You have a fundamentally untenable financial situation here. Insufficient reserves, foggy motives. What businessman can trust you when he knows that your lab production workers might walk out one fine day and stay out? They aren't bound by salaries, but by idealism. It's kept us going. Until now. Come, Mrs. Jonathan. I said I wanted an advocate in the council. He thumbed out the deck of bills all the way from the pocket in the open briefcase. You have a business head. You know that if you do produce my Marcane and the Thief, Mr. Graham's little story, which I read with great interest, will be another bad hump to get over. There will be more. He meant two things. More humps and more sheafs of thousand-dollar bills for her if she took the bribe. Mimi smiled without moving a muscle of her face. It had been a long time since she talked this kind of talk, but she still knew how. The smile stayed inside her head. Her face displayed only the most casual interest. "'Are you offering to buy the colony, Mr. Brenner? "'Would you care to name a price?' "'What are you asking?' he countered. "'Oh, no,' she thought. "'You're not getting away with that.' "'All right, we'll play it your way,' she said. "'Name two prices. "'You want to buy my services, too, don't you?' "'Whatever gives you that notion. "'I'm not trying to bribe you, Mrs. Jonathan.' "'He picked up the sheaf of bills and placed them in front of her. "'There's a hundred thousand here.' I can bring another, say, another four hundred thousand, for a down payment, whenever you say. My price for the colony, he added distinctly. 
is exactly five million. Plus your down payment? She asked, amused. That's right. That would just about pay all our fares back to Earth. We'll smash the lab to bits before we let you get it for any such price. You'll rot in prison if you do, Brenner said easily. There is an injunction on file at Marsport signed by Commissioner Bell restraining you from any such foolishness. An act of contempt would mean imprisonment for all of you. I mean all. No such paper has been served on us. The Commissioner assured me it had been served. I don't doubt his word. Not many people, including appeals judges, would doubt his word either. Mimi didn't dare answer this display of force. She set her teeth and thought about five million and five hundred thousand. Passage home and respectability of having sold instead of going bankrupt. Maybe the chance of another charter and another try. It'll have to be put into form by the council and voted on by the entire colony, she said painfully. You want an advance? Take your money back. I'm not for sale. But I will plead your case if you'll make it ten million. God knows it's a bargain. There's absolutely no depreciation on the lab to be figured. It's better now than it ever was. Maintenance has always been top level. Better than anything you'll ever be able to find in industry. Five million and five hundred thousand was my offer. I'm not the Croesus uninformed people take me for. I have my expenses on Marcane distribution end, you know. Tony sweated out the time. Eight minutes creeping along the chalk line in the dark. He'd left the light with Anna. Five minutes scrabbling over the boulders at the cave opening on the face of the hill. Twelve long minutes talking the guards into leaving, and a painful, tortured eternity, maybe another twelve minutes, re-entering the cave and tracing the chalk line by the dim light borrowed from Ted. Tony was sweating ice by the time the radiance from Anna's light came into view. He rounded the last curve in the winding passage, and something jumped up from the floor, straightened and stood, tense and watchful as the doctor. Anna, seated on the cold floor, laughed softly, melodiously. She was all right. Tony relaxed a little and instantly felt something, a gentle stroking, a tentative touch, not on his head, but in it. No menace, no danger. Friendship. The doctor stared across the cavern. Leathery brown skin, barrel chest, big ears, skinny arms and legs, the height of a small man or a large boy, and a telepath. The friendly touch on his mind persisted, through his quick distaste, his exaltation, his eagerness. Anna, very softly, is it all right to talk? Not too loud, his ears are sensitive. Who is he? Are there more? Does he have Sonny? Ask him that, Anna, ask him. A brownie, she laughed again joyously. You told me that. There are four more down there, inside, with Sonny. Is he all right? Yes, they took him to help him not to do any harm. He needed something, but I can't find out what. The brownie squatted again on the floor beside Anna. Tony approached slowly and sat down next to them. He felt goose flesh and memories of old nursery book horrors, but nothing happened. He forced himself to ask Anna, What kind of thing? Something to eat, I think. Something like the first sip of water when you're thirsty, and as necessary as salt, and good. Maybe like a vitamin? But it tastes wonderful. Tony ran through a mental catalogue of biochemicals, but that was foolish. How could you tell what would taste good to anything as alien as a brownie? Have you tried sign language? he asked Anna. Where do you start? she shrugged. You have to build up a whole set of symbols before you can get anything across. Tony, I'm sure we can get the baby back if we just understand what it is he needs. The doctor reached over, hesitated, and forced himself to tap the brownie lightly on the shoulder. When he had the creature's attention, he whispered to Anna, "'Tell him we're trying to find out what it is.' He pointed to his own eyes. "'Show us,' he said to the creature, and tried to project the thought, the image of seeing, as hard as he could. They kept repeating it with every possible combination of thought and act. Then suddenly the brownie jumped and dashed off down the tunnel. "'Did he get the idea?' demanded Tony. "'Is he coming back?' "'It's all right,' smiled Anna. "'He understood.' Silence in the eerie place was almost unbearable. "'Don't worry so, Tony,' Anna said. "'If you want to know, he almost scared the wits out of me, too. "'I was sitting, trying to look down the little opening "'and still talking to the ones down there, "'and he came up behind me. "'I was concentrating on them, so I didn't hear him either way.' "'Tony sat back thoughtfully. "'It was all true, then. "'His crazy theory was right. "'There were actually brownies on Mars, "'a form of life so highly developed that it was telepathic.' with no lower life-forms to have evolved from. 
He wondered if he had hit the right explanation, too, but there was no other explanation. The brownie was back, carrying something. A box. Large letters in black on the side read, Danger. Sealed Marcane container. Do not open without authorization. Brenner Pharmaceutical Company.